Good morning. Um, I hope all this, I hope this message finds you well this morning. I'd ask you to pray with me this morning as again we're uh, broadcasting on on Facebook and church is kind of empty around here. So uh, pray with me this morning. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for delivering us thus far through this terrible pandemic. And Lord, we just pray that you would keep a hedge of protection around America. And Lord, especially around your church. And allow this time to get out among the lost people of this world and witness for you. Uh, Lord, we just pray that the sick are among us. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would put your healing touch upon them, being the great physician that you are. Lord, we just pray that you would take care of those families. And Lord, just give them that grace they need and the special touch that they need to survive this time. Lord, we pray that uh, anyone in the sound of our voice that hears this message, if they don't know you as their personal Savior, Lord, I pray today that you would touch that heart and uh, let them know that you are the Lord of the Lord and King of kings. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And good morning again. We're in the book of Galatians. Uh, we're going to be looking at the eighth, uh, fourth chapter, eighth verse through the eighteenth verse this morning. So if you if you're there with me and you're following along with your Bibles, which I pray you are, verse eight, chapter four. Howbeit then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now, after that, ye have known God, or rather, are known of God. How turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elders, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Ye observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me at all. Ye know how through infirmities of the flesh I preach the gospel unto you at the first, and my temptation was in my flesh. Ye despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. There is then the blessedness ye spoke of, for I bear you record that if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Wow. Am I therefore become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth. They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. Be it is good to be zealous. Affect always in a good thing, but not only when I am present with you. Wow. Well, we have, let me give you a little bit of a backdrop if you're just joining us uh, this morning. Paul is doing battle with the Judaizers. Uh, they have come into the newly formed church there in Galatia, and they have said, no, it's not Jesus and Jesus alone. It's Jesus plus something. Listen, that's not the gospel. That is not the gospel. If anyone says that to you, uh, yeah, run. Uh, do not be there. Uh, if, if it's Jesus plus anything, that's wrong. Uh, Paul went on in, in, in chapter 1 and he said, let them be a curse. Let them be damned if they preach any other gospel than Jesus Christ. Him crucified alone for your sins. That's it. It's not Jesus plus the law. It's not Jesus plus anything. It's just Jesus. He's the only one worthy. So with that, let's look here at Paul. He's in the fourth chapter. We're going to see uh, in this chapter some very revealing things about Paul. We're going to see the love and the discipline that come from Paul. It's going to shine through. So there in verse 8, we're going to see, uh, How be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no God. Well, what's he talking about there? He's talking about these Galatians. They were idolizers. They uh, practiced idolatry. Well, Brother Mark, what is idolatry? I can sum it for you pretty simple. 
is anything or anyone or any place that you put in place of God Almighty. It is just that simple. It's not hard to understand. If you're putting, washing your car <laughs> before worshiping God this morning, that is an idol. If your house is before worshiping God, that is an idol. If your wife, listen to me, or your husband, you put them before worshiping God, guess what? That's an idol. Uh, God has said, you shall have no other, idol, no other gods before me. Look, if anything else to you is a God, there's a problem. Uh, get that right in your mind. God is first. He is jealous. He will not be second. And uh, all glory should go to him. Trust me. But these Galatians, uh, back to the scripture here, these Galatians were, they worshiped idols, okay? It was their downfall from the first. Well, the Judaizers, they picked up on these idol worshipers, and they saw their weakness immediately. And they said, well, hey, we'll just get them back to the Mosaic system. We'll sell them Jesus plus the law. Okay, again, when you hear Jesus plus anything, my Savior is an all-sufficient Savior. He doesn't need anything else. When he paid for your sins on the cross, when he said it is finished and hung his head, he meant it was finished. You don't need anything else but Christ to go to heaven. Well, they, these Judaizers, they were saying, hey, Jesus is a great, and truly he is. But you need Jesus plus the Mosaic Law. No. Okay, that's legalism. That's the definition of legalism. Okay, the Judaizers were making the law into the Galatian idols. So you see where he's at here. But now, after that, ye have known God, or rather, are known of God. How turn ye to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Listen. This, this law, uh, the Mosaic law, the Ten Commandments, uh, look, they're a perfect reflection of God's moral character. Uh, they're absolutely flawless. They're who, a glimpse of who God is. Uh, so if you think as a fallen man you can keep that, uh, they couldn't. If a Jew couldn't, and look, if a Pharisee, uh, now they tithed on their herbs. Really? I'm telling you. They tithed on their herbs. If a Jew could not keep the Ten Commandments, how in the world do you think a Gentile such as you and I are going to? Look, we cannot. It's been proved time and time again. They could not. We're fallen. We have sin-blistered souls. We are fallen men. You cannot keep the law. That's why Christ had to come. That's how, why Christ had to die for your sins. Uh, it is the only way to bring you back to a right relationship with God. It is the only way. The law will not do it. It could never do it. The only thing the law can do is make you say, hey, I'm keeping this law outwardly. Let me give you an easy example. Uh, uh, the law says, thou shalt not bear false witness, right? You heard me. You shouldn't lie. Okay? False witness. How many haven't told a white lie? Okay. If you say you haven't, I'm going to probably going to tell you you're lying. Right there. So, if you break one point of the law, God doesn't care about the rest of the law. God cares about the point that you that you messed up. The point that you disobeyed him. He said, don't lie. You lied. Okay, so when he when he looks at you and you stand on your merit, he's going to say, no, you broke my commandments. Depart from me. Uh, you work in iniquity. I never knew. He's going to send you to hell because you died without his son's saving grace. The, the Judaizers here are trying to just nail you down to yeah, it's Jesus, but it's Jesus plus something. No, it is not Jesus plus anything. It's Jesus Christ and him alone that saves your soul. Uh, we get legalistic. We get churches get legalistic. They, You know, I, it kills me when we practice church discipline. Now, should we? Absolutely. Uh, the house of God should be clean. Okay? If someone's in it and in a blatant open sin, 
uh, and then we'll repent at that time, then we need to, as a group, as a body, discipline those people that are out of the will of God. Okay, I agree. But where we drop the ball is we never seek to restore that brother after he's repented of his sin. We absolutely drop the ball. And we, we have no right to do that. We need to come to our brothers and sisters in Christ in love every single time. And the goal always has got to be to restore. And it kills me that we, that we execute the law with such judgmental actions, but never practicing the love of Christ and trying to restore the brother. Never. And it kills me. I, and I pray you never do that. If you're in a church and they're doing that, you need to stop. Uh, our goal should always be in love and to restore the brother. Uh, name me a Christian today that's not sinned probably today. I'd love to spend a day with them. We'll take the law and, and uh, we'll look over their lives. I'd love to. Hit, hit me a text. I'll, I'll, I'll come see you. But Paul's driving the point home here that we cannot live by the law. We can't live by a stringent law. It's not possible. It is possible for God. He's absolutely perfect. He is flawless. He wrote the law. He can live by it. He does live by it. And that's why he can justly uh, say, you turned your back on my son, depart from me. Uh, you're going to burn hell forever. Uh, that's why he can justly do that. And we've proved today that if you've ever told a white lie, you've broken his law, the Ten Commandments. You've broken it. So is he just and righteous in sending you to hell? Yes. You can't say, well, I didn't know. Well, yeah, you did know. Uh, even if you've never read the Ten Commandments, your conscience tells you, which he put in your mind, never to lie. You're not supposed to lie. You're not supposed to kill. You're not supposed to steal. So you can't say you don't know. Is God just in doing what he has to do? Absolutely. Uh, these uh, Galatians here, they're going back into idolatry. Uh, and you can put a law on it or a day on it or whatever you want to put on it, but it's Jesus plus something else. Okay, what did he say in chapter 1? Let them be accursed or damned if they preach any other gospel than the one Paul had shared with them. So they are. They're teaching another gospel. Verse 10, you observe days of the month, times of years and the years. Look, they worship the moon. I mean, these people are all over the page. Uh, they worship everything. Uh, inanimate objects. Um, all these things they worship. You know, the child of God, uh, and I'm gonna, we're going to talk a little bit about the child of God and the actions of the child of God. The child of God obeys God out of love. Okay? The servant obeys him out of fear. That's the difference. That is the absolute difference. Now, when you go from being a child of God with liberty and freedom, as you have, if you go back under the bondage of the law, well, then you're fearful of God, right? That's what you are. You're fearful of God. And um, Christ called you to be like him more and more every day. Uh, that's the mark of a Christian. We're to be Christ-like more and more every day. We've got to get this right. If it's Jesus plus anything, it's nothing. It is legalism at its best. Paul brought the gospel to the Galatians. Uh, Paul saw a massive number of Galatians come to know Christ. And when he was teaching them, um, you know, they turned to him. Uh, they, they turned to Paul in love and they accepted Christ. You know, uh, how through infirmities of the flesh, we're going to get into this in just a second. You know how through the infirmities of the flesh, I preach the gospel unto you. And my temptation was not in my flesh. You despise not. You rejected, but received me as an angel of God. Look, Paul was not comely to look at. What I mean by comely. He was not attractive to look at by all indications here. Uh, and I don't mean to gross you out, but we're going to talk about some facts about Paul today. Uh, when he talks about the thorn in his fl flesh, most people believe, and I believe this scripture supports that, that it was his eye. The thorn in his flesh. He prayed three times for God to remove it. Each time, God said, my grace is sufficient. So, Paul had to, Paul had to understand that God intended for him to be that way. And his grace was sufficient. 
shooting. But when Paul came to preach to the Galatians, it kind of bounced back here at the first, when Paul first led them to Christ, okay? And these are sons of God. Don't get confused now. We're not talking about lost people, even at this point in their Christian walk. And he said, you know, through the infirmities of the flesh, I preached the gospel to you at the first. So that was at the beginning. And my temptation was in my, was, which was in my flesh, you despised not nor rejected, but revealed, re received me as an angel of God, even as Jesus Christ. So look here. What was going on with his eyes? Well, in that region, even, uh, well, probably not in the last 20 years, but up to that, uh, they had very few medications. You know, here in America, we enjoy vast freedoms here. That's the greatest country in the world. You can run down to the pharmacy or to the doctor and get any kind of prescription you need for anything. Well, those kinds of things that was going on with Paul in that time, he couldn't get any medication to fix that. So ultimately what happened is uh, pus and drainage came out of his eyes all the time. Now these uh, Galatians here, uh, at this time when he's talking about at the first, they received him with open arms, even though when he looked at them, they seen what a mess his eyes were in. Uh, they seen how badly he was afflicted. Look, Paul was, Paul was beat bad. Uh, he had been, he, three times he had received 39 stripes. One more kills you. He'd been shipwrecked, bitten by a viper. Look, this guy was, he was marred, okay? Uh, he wasn't marred more than Christ. No man was ever marred more than Christ, but Paul was marred up. And now his eyes oozed of pus. I hope I'm not gross, gross, grossing you out, but you need to get the gravity of the situation here. What he's saying to the Galatians, you received me as an angel of God. Now in verse 15, look at that. Where is then the blessing that you spoke of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eye and have given them to me. I got a lot of great friends. I really do. I love them all. They're good people. Uh, they try hard, but like any sin blister soul, they fail a lot. But I don't know any of them. I don't even know a family member that would pluck his eye out. You probably don't either. But if you do, send me a text. I'd like to meet this person that would pluck his own eye out and give it to you. That's what he's saying about these Galatian believers here in 15. That if they could have, they would have plucked their eye out of their head, okay, and given it to Paul. That's how rough he looked. And that's how suffering he was. I mean, Paul suffered. But look what came through suffering with Paul. Wow. All this gospel. All this beautiful gospel written. All the love that flowed out of Paul continually. And he's, got, he's asking him here, uh, where is the blessedness that you had for me at one time? You would have plucked out your eyes and gave that to me at one time. And here we are, back under the law, back into the idle part of the law, and uh, you want to kill me. <laughs> but he's asking him here, where is that blessedness? Where, where's the love that was there? Kind of a, a scathing rebuke uh, out of Paul's mouth. He was you know, he was about love. Uh, he was, he tried every day to be Christ-like, like you and I should. We should be Christ-like daily. But Paul says here, where, where's that love? Where's that blessedness that you spoke of? Wow. So in verse 17 here, it says, um, Oh, no, 16, am I therefore becoming your enemy because I tell you the truth? Wow. I'm going to step on your toes a little bit this morning probably, but it's okay. Uh, if I just patted you on the back, you shouldn't be here. How often do we go to church and we hear something that steps on our toes a little bit? Uh, it's not the preacher guy. Uh, he's not singling you out, I don't think. He is, he ought to pretend. But uh, when he preaches the word of God, it convicts you, and you want to take him out behind the building and stone him. How often is that? How often do we want to hold the messenger responsible for the message? Look, God said it. If you don't like it, this is easy. 
Take it up with Jesus when you get to heaven. Okay? Uh, don't beat up on the guy bringing you the message. Uh, we're, we're just trying to get you the truth. And I, I hope you receive it as such. But Paul's saying here in 16, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? How so often in today's time do we make the pastor or someone that's trying to declare the word of God the enemy? Listen, if all I do is pat you on the back, you already go somewhere else. If I never step on your toes, I'm probably not doing my job. They zealously affect you, but not well. They would ex exclude you. Excuse me here. They would excuse, exclude you that you may affect them. Hmm. Let's talk a little bit about that for a second. Um, it, it's kind of a pain to understand there, but let me read you up. Let me read you a, uh, a uh, translation here. They zealously seek you in no good way. Nay, they desire to shut you out that ye may seek them. But it is good to be zealous, sought in a good manner at all times, and not only when I am present with you. Look, they did not want to lift Christ up. It was not Christ they were trying to lift up. It was not Christ that they were wanting to exalt. They wanted to get back to the Mosaic system where the Pharisees and the priests had all the high offices and people sought to see them instead of looking to, to Christ. Uh, that's what that verse is saying. That's exactly what it means. They want to run you away from Christ, the one that can keep you out of bondage, the one that has taken you and me out of bondage, and they want to put you back under the yoke of the law. Well, thank God uh, most of us don't have to live that way unless we're terribly legalistic and you still don't have to live that way. You know, you think back, and I know some of you are older, uh, you think back to when you first became a Christian. Do you remember how there was no guilt? Do you remember how you, you, you pondered in your mind, how can this be? How can I be, probably the chief of all sinners, forgiven of all, the bad things I've ever done. How can that be? Jesus Christ. Uh, he paid for those bad things on the cross. Uh, he paid for me and he paid for you. Uh, he paid for those sins. Uh, he, paid, he paid every bit of it. Uh, your guilt, your sin debt had been paid for. Has been paid for. Is going to be paid for. Uh, Christian. Do not be under the low yoke of the law. You cannot stand it. We can't live that way. Uh, you live under grace. Uh, you, you live under Jesus' grace. Uh, the grace that uh, he paid for your sin. The grace that the law cannot send you to hell now. These Galatian believers, look here. They're not lost. Uh, Paul said he, that he might have spent time with them in vain. They're not lost. Uh, these believers need restored back to a right way of thinking. But they are just as much a son of God. Look here. I have people tell me all the time, well, I'm backslidden. Okay. You fell into, you've fallen into a sin, and apparently you've kept sinning for a while. Does that make you any less of a child of God? Absolutely not. It harms your standing with him at the moment, but your state, as far as who you are in Christ, is exactly where it was. Uh, you cannot lose your salvation. I don't know whoever thought you could. Uh, but you cannot lose your salvation. God says he will not lose one of the hundred. Not one of the ninety and nine. He won't lose it. I don't know what kind of reassurance you guys need, but that's good enough for me. If Christ says it, I believe it. That's it. It doesn't, it doesn't require anything else. It doesn't even require, require me to believe it, but I'm telling you I do. Uh, Look, you cannot live under the burden of the law. He paid that debt. It has been paid. It is being paid. And it will be paid on Jesus Christ's shoulder. Uh, we have got to get that straight. Please don't live that way. You remember back in that time when you got saved. You remember when you first got saved. You felt joy, right? 
Well, this backslidden person doesn't feel that joy. Why? Well, he's out of fellowship with God. He's doing something continually, right, that he knows is wrong. And he's doing something continually that is a sin, whether that's adultery or uh, stealing. You name the sin. One of us around here could probably claim it. But uh, the point is, he's still a son of God. And there's nothing you and I or he can do about that. Now, I don't know when he's going to write his relationship. I pray it doesn't take him very long. Uh, God won't have his, God's not mocked. He won't have his name drawn through the mud. And he'll call you home. Uh, and then if you view that as a warning, you probably should. Get your life straight. Uh, repent of the sin you're in. Give it to God and ask for help. But these Galatians, even though they were back worshiping the law again, and days and moons and, and uh, look, even though they were still sons of God, they were still the children of God. They were still the children of the promise. Look, uh, we've been saved. And uh, if you think that God thinks that you're not going to stumble and fall in your walk, you're crazy. He knows you. He knows me. And he already knows when you're going to stumble and fall. Uh, we need to be careful to try not to. But when we do, we need to repent and ask God for forgiveness and help. These Judaizers, uh, they were after one simple thing. They wanted you to follow them. They weren't interested in God's law, really. They were just looking for something to point at you and say, look, aha, you're not following that. We've got to be careful to guard against that. Uh, now should we give sin a place? No. When you've identified it as a sin in your life, it is your moral responsibility to God, not to me, uh, to get that straight. Uh, you're not to live in sin. You're to be Christ-like. Christ didn't have sin in his life. Uh, how do you know that, Brother Mark? Well, I'll tell you. He couldn't be your Savior if he did. That's how I know that. Uh, he absolutely was a sinless person. He lived 33 years without one sin, but yet died for yours and mine. Yeah, that's how I know that. So these uh, Judaizers, like many wolves in sheep clothing that are among the flock today, that are among the children of God, they don't know God, uh, they want you to follow them. Be weary. Look, this ministry is not about me. It's about Jesus Christ. And that's it. Uh, it's about the love of Jesus Christ. It's about seeing his saints grow in the abnomition of the Lord. Uh, it's not about me. Uh, it's not about this building. This building is not the church. You are the church. We are uh, the live body of Christ. Uh, we're to be proclaiming his name daily. Do not let people put you under the law. Christ don't want you there. He paid the law in full. He does not want his child there. He wants you to have the joy of your salvation. He wants, to real, wants you to realize that your past, present, and future sins have been paid. Every single one of them. Uh, he paid those on the cross. As horrible as it was, he paid them there on the cross at Calvary. So don't let anyone convince you that you need to uh, get back under the law and convince you that it's Jesus plus something else. It's Jesus Christ and him alone. Um, but Paul's trying to drive back home to the Galatians here that, hey, it's not too late. Uh, your salvation is not gone. Christ didn't go anywhere. He's standing right there beside of you. You're in sin. You're separated from him a little bit, but he will never leave you. Stay sticks closer than a brother. Uh, he will never, ever leave you or depart from you. So uh, we need to understand that although we might backslide, we might get into a legalistic sin, repent. Turn away from that sin and go back. Uh, go back to uh, the joy of your salvation. Uh, we, we, we have to get that down as Christians today. Now, if y'all tuned in last week, we'll... We'll go on from verse 18 next week, but 
If y'all tuned in last week, you heard me talk about 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Well, I don't think y'all got the message. I'm going to have to give it to you again today. So, uh, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, Christians, that's you. I'm not talking about the lost people around about us. Which are called by my name, again, Christian, right? Shall humble themselves and pray. Well, Brother Mark, what are you talking about? Last week when we were together, I begged you to pray that our land would be healed. I, I begged you to repent and pray that our land would be healed. Well, apparently numbers are on the rise. <laughs> so uh, we'll get on with this. I... <clears throat> shall humble themselves, pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Listen, these are promises from God. I know that he cannot tell a lie. Okay? It's the only thing that God can't do. Cannot lie. It's not in him. Titus 1-2, if you don't believe me, don't take my word, but look in Titus 1-2. He cannot lie. And he says to you, if you'll repent and pray, Repent of your wicked ways and pray. He will hear from heaven. He'll forgive your sin, number one. And number two, he'll heal your land. Oh, how much we need our land healed today. Uh, coronavirus is going crazy, among other things. Uh, but uh, Christians, I begged you all to pray last week. I'm going to beg you again. I'm begging you to pray. Uh, the reason I know that uh, you haven't been praying and uh, repenting of your sins and humbling yourself is we haven't seen a turn in the coronavirus. You think God can't beat this virus? Uh, look, he created the world in seven days. Don't tell me he can't. Don't tell me he's out of the mirror for business. You're lying. Uh, and you haven't repented. You haven't been praying. And he hasn't heard from heaven and healed your land. I'm begging you. Please pray for this nation. In the world that God will and repent that God will heal the land. Y'all stand with me and uh, we'll pray. Heavenly Father, don't ever let us become complacent and be like these Galatians. Don't ever let us think that it takes Jesus plus something else. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. And thank you for him. Lord, we pray here today, First Baptist, we pray that that you would heal our land. We pray that Christians everywhere are repenting and are in prayer to you to have the land healed. Lord, we pray for the sick. Lord, we pray that you would touch them as only the mighty maker came and healed them. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. 